Good afternoon, Jakarta, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, members of the audience, and good morning to distinguished to our sorry to our distinguished guests from an audience in Berlin. Welcome to the fifth class CSIS Germany Indonesia Strategic Dialogue Webinar Series Road to Indonesia's G20 Presidency, organized by the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung together with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. My name is Sheila Jasmine, and I will be your virtual host for the three-day event. Before we begin today's event, please allow me to warmly greet our panelists. Please welcome His Excellency Ambassador Arif Hafas Ugroseno, Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Federal Republic of Germany. Her Excellency Ambassador Ina Lepel, Ambassador of the Rep of the Federal Republic of Germany to the Republic of Indonesia. I would also like to extend my, my greetings to the key, key figures of this event, Dr. Philip Schaefer-Monte, the Executive Director, CSIS Indonesia, Mr. Jansen Kir, the Resident Representative of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung of Indonesia and Timur Leste, and Dr. Shafiah F. Muhibat, Head of the Department of International Relations, CSIS Indonesia. I would also like to extend our personal greetings to our panelists for today, Dr. Suminto, Assistant of Minister for Financial Sector Policy and Secretary of Financial System Stability Committee of Ministry of Finance, Republic of Indonesia, Dr. Yose Rizal Damuri, Head of the Department of Economics, CSIS Indonesia, and last but not least, Dr. Phil Habil, Patrick Zickenhain, Associate Professor at the Department of International Relations, President University, Indonesia. Thank you for joining us today. A very good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to all participants. Before we start the session, I would like to announce that this webinar will be held for three days with three different themes under the grand theme of commemorating Indonesia's G20 Presidency in 2022. Today's session will be held under the theme of engaging an equal, resilient, and productive global economic recovery through the G20. I would also like to remind you that English will be our main working language in today's event. Simultaneous interpretation to Bahasa Indonesia is available under the interpretation feature, which you can find on the lower right-hand corner of your Zoom display. 
please don't forget to click the mute original audio option on the feature for better interpretation. Ladies and gentlemen, we will begin with opening remarks from Dr. Philip C. Fermonte, Executive Director of CSIS Indonesia, and Mr. Jan Senkir, Resident Rep Rep Representative sorry, of CAS of Indonesia and Timor Leste. And followed by keynote speech from Ambassador Arif Hafaz Ugroseno, the Ambassador of Republic of Indonesia to the Federal Republic of Germany, and Ambassador Ina Lepel, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Indonesia, Timor Leste, and ASEAN. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Philips Fremonte to give his welcoming remarks. Dr. Fremonte, the screen is yours. Thank you. Uh, and very good uh, afternoon for those of you who are attending from Indonesia and uh, very good morning uh, to everyone from, uh, from Germany. Uh, Excellencies, uh, Ambassador Harif, Arif Hafas of Gresano, uh, long time no see, Pak Hafas, it's good to see you on the screen. Uh, Her Excellency Ina Lepel, uh, Ambassador of Federal Republic of Germany to the Republic of Indonesia, thank you for agreeing to do this uh, with us. Uh, also, uh, our good friend, uh, Mr. Jan Senkir, Director of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for Indonesia and Timor Leste. It's been a pleasure for CSIS to work with CAS, uh, and this is the fifth time we organize this uh, Germany-Indonesia dialogue. I also would like to thank Dr. Suminto, uh, Assistant of Minister of Financial for Financial Sector Policy and Secretary of Financial System Stability Committee of the Ministry of Finance of the Republic of Indonesia, my colleague, Dr. Jose Rizal Damuri, and also my good friend, Dr. Dr. Patrick Chickenhain, uh, who is now residing in Indonesia, a long time no see, Patrick. It's good to see you and happy birthday to you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, must be a, a, a very interesting uh, birthday party you had yesterday. Also, our moderator, uh, Ms. Felipa Amanta. Uh, over the next three days, <clears throat> uh, we will have, uh, in collaboration with Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, our <clears throat> fifth Germany-Indonesia strategic dialogue. This dialogue aims to generate collaborative and innovative discussion for a better global recovery, along with Indonesia's G20 presidency. The theme of the dialogue, <clears throat> as we all know, uh, is Road to Indonesia's G20 presidency. And we organize the, the, the topics of the sessions expand from the theme onto three uh, topics. Uh, the first is engaging an equal, resilient, and productive global economic recovery through the G20. And second, seizing momentum for sustainability through the G20. And third, prospect for preparation and promotion of digital transformation under the G20. If I may say a few words about the context of Indonesia's G20 presidency. Uh, uh, President Joko Widodo uh, frequently emphasizes a global, uh, the need for a global strong collaboration and innovation on the G20. Our foreign minister at Marsudi stated uh, some times ago that uh, our world economy has experienced a decline last year. However, this year there's a positive growth trend of 6% and is expected to continue until year 2022. However, uh, given the situation of the pandemic, the international community still fears unequal economic development in the post-pandemic period. That's why we raised this topic of discussion with the theme of engaging an equal resilience and productive global economic recovery through the G20. Indonesia put the grand theme of recover together, recover stronger for its G20 presidency in 2022. The theme is of course based on Indonesia's experience on overseeing an unequal global vaccines distribution. Uh, we experience vaccine nationalism and hoarding by several countries, which affects many states' capability in containing the pandemic vis-a-vis -vis post COVID economic recovery. Therefore, it is important for Indonesia to push the G20 forward underlying the establishment of a joint finance and health task force in order to push member state preparedness and response to prevent similar pandemic situation in the future. 
the question would be for Indonesia, being the G20 chair next year, can Indonesia utilize its position to push countries, <clears throat> companies, big companies, pharmaceuticals companies to further provide manufacturing capacity for vaccine development for emerging developing economies. As mentioned by Foreign Minister Marsudi, for Indonesia and for many countries, no one should be left behind. No one is safe until everyone is safe. So I think this is the first context of the Indonesia's G20's presidency. Secondly, the other context is that Indonesia prioritizes issues such as climate change and sustainability. Indonesia's term would serve as a platform to promote global partnership and funding in supporting energy transition to cleaner and renewable ones. As stated also by our foreign minister at Marsudi, the pillars of Indonesia's presidencies are enabling, presidency are in enabling environment and partnership, promoting productivity, increasing resilience and stability, ensuring sustainable and inclusive growth and stronger collective global leadership. Indonesia believes from what we gather from various statements from our officials, from the president to the ministers, that Indonesia believes that the G20 has affirmed its position in terms of conducting international and economic diplomacy, which will be important in the context of the recovery post-pandemic situation. Now, we also, I think, have to think about the hopes and expectation from Indonesia's G20 presidency, which would be, I think, be beneficial if we, through this dialogue, can also trying to fulfill and prepare for the meet of the hopes and expectation from Indonesia's G20 presidency. Indonesia's 2022 presidency will provide the G20 with opportunity to focus on promoting inclusive growth while demonstrating Indonesia's growing political influence and offering a chance to shift global attention to the region's need. This is in line with Indonesia's plan to push for more inclusivity. Indonesia's position will also probably be mostly focused on representing the voices of the developing countries sitting outside the G20 to be the bridge, so to speak. The presidency also presents a unique opportunity for global leaders to deliver more inclusive, sustainable economic development for a region that desperately needs assistance. With COVID-19 being top priority for Indonesia, some argued that COVID-19 has also accelerated trend of such as populism, growing nationalism, and democratic regression. Although this is not directly related to G20 task of a financial institution, so to speak, the pandemic somehow has shown the gap between G20 governments, which resulted in proposed cooperative action that were not probably compatible with individual government's incentive. With this in mind, Indonesia is also expected to act as the guardian of G20 multilateralism, a theme that Indonesia would also would like to push uh, given the pandemic, that see that <clears throat> uh, we witness growing uh, nationalist sentiment and unilateral action by some big countries. And therefore, Indonesia expected to also address the gap between G20 members. Indonesia will be expected to press G20 leaders for their commitment to deliver on triple dividend agenda, maximizing investment in health and economic development, to achieve climate-friendly, sustainable growth at local, regional, and global levels. Now, I think that should be enough for me to say, uh, to give us the context from the Indonesian perspective. And I believe Mr. Jan Sankir of the CAS Foundation would also give us the context of uh, Germany's views on the Indonesia's G20 presidency. Thank you all for the participation for, uh, through through Zoom and through YouTube uh, this afternoon. I hope we are going to have a fruitful discussion over the next two or three days. Thank you. Back to you, Sheila. Thank you for your warm remarks, Dr. Uh, Philip Fermonte. And now I would like to invite Mr. Jan Senkir uh, to give his welcoming remarks. To Mr. Jan Senkir, you may have the screen. 
Selamat siang. Um, good afternoon to our friends and partners in Indonesia, and good morning to our uh, partners in Germany. Um, <clears throat> Excellencies, uh, Ambassador Mr. Agroseno, uh, Ambassador Ms. Lepel, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Philip Swermonte, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear uh, friends and partners in Indonesia and in Germany, uh, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung to the opening of the <clears throat> fifth Germany-Indonesia strategic dialogue, uh, <clears throat> which will deal uh, with uh, the uh, issues and topics uh, being uh, put on the agenda uh, by Indonesia during its presidency of the G20 uh, next year. The Germany-Indonesia strategic dialogue is a discussion and uh, uh, <clears throat> dialogue platform which uh, was established five years ago by CAS and uh, CSIS. Uh, um, by the way, uh, if you look at the logo of CSIS, we see the number 50, since Dr. Vermonte has mentioned uh, birthday today uh, or yesterday, uh, uh, CSIS has its 50th anniversary of its uh, uh, foundation. So I would like to congratulate um, CSIS. It is uh, uh, regularly among the top think tanks worldwide in the ranking of think tanks. It is uh, a leading it has a leading position here in Southeast Asia and also a, a top position in the world. So for us as Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, it is an honor and a pleasure to cooperate with CSIS. So as I said, this strategic dialogue is aiming to uh, provide an, an exchange and uh, a discussion of uh, issues uh, of strategic importance uh, for both of our countries and also for on a global level. Um, <clears throat> the G20 presidency of Indonesia next year gives us a good opportunity to um, tackle on some issues which are currently uh, uh, of uh, an, an strategic uh, and uh, urgent importance uh, worldwide. It is basically the economic recovery uh, after the um, COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> um, it is uh, the uh, challenge of climate change and environment, and uh, it is the issue uh, of uh, sustainable development. These are, I think, the three topics that Indonesia is going to put on the agenda next year. Um, <clears throat> Last week, uh, during the uh, G20 summit in Rome, in Italy, uh, Italy is the, has the current uh, chair of uh, G20. Um, the presidency was symbolically handed over by the prime, in, Italian prime minister, uh, Mario Draghi, to Indonesian president, Joko Widodo. So in the, Indonesia is going to take over uh, since uh, uh, December, from, from December, as I understood, uh, the theme that is chosen by Indonesia is recover together, recover stronger. And as I said, it is uh, <clears throat> comprising of the issues of the global economy and health, climate change and environment and sustainable development. And we are also going to reflect these topics during our uh, uh, the uh, webinar the next three days. Uh, <clears throat> um, I would um, like to thank the speakers of participating today. I just would mention that we had to, on a very short notice, to change the German speaker. So I am very grateful that uh, Dr. Patrick Siegenhain has agreed uh, on this short notice to participate and to, um, uh, to speak uh, today. And of course, I, I also thank uh, the uh, other speakers. Uh, 
Dr. Suminto, Dr. Jose Rizal Damuri, and uh, also uh, the, uh, the moderator, uh, Ms. Felipa. So I'm, uh, I thank you for the participation. I uh, would like to thank uh, CSIS uh, once again for the cooperation which, as I said, is, has been uh, lasting already five years, and we would like to continue in this cooperation. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants uh, for uh, joining us today and also the next three days. And I wish everybody uh, an interesting and fruitful um, discussion. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Thank you, Mr. Jensen Kir, for the excellent remark. May it serve well for our knowledge for the upcoming session. And now I would like to invite Ambassador Arif Hafaz Ugroseno to give his keynote speech for our discussion today. But before I hand my screen to Ambassador Ugroseno, I would like to uh, I would like to recite uh, I would like to recite his biography first. Uh, so uh, Ambassador Arif Hafaz Ugroseno is Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Federal Republic of Germany. And he was previously the Deputy Minister for Maritime Sovereignty, uh, Coordinating Ministry for, Mar for Maritime Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia in 2015 until 2018. And he was Ambassador of the Republic of Indonesia to the Kingdom of Belgium, Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and the European Union in 2000 and in, in, in to, uh, until 2015. He's an alumnus of the Harvard Law School, uh, United, uh, United States. And now, uh, please let me invite Ambassador Ugrosena uh, to deliver his speech. Uh, Ambassador, the screen is yours. Uh, terima kasih, uh, Sheila. Uh, good morning in Germany. Um, selamat uh, siang di uh, Indonesia, uh, Mr. Senker, uh, Philip, Pak Suminto, Pak Yosef Rizal, and of course uh, Tina, Excellency, Ambassador of uh, Germany to Indonesia, uh, and also Pak Patrick, uh, how are you Pak Patrick, and also uh, Philippa here. So um, first of all, let me uh, Congratulate the CSIS for the 50th anniversary. Uh, it's, a, it's a very prestigious, uh, uh, I would say, the most, if, 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 if I believe so privately, personally, that the think tank in Indonesia and has been recently developing a very uh, interesting series of uh, discussion and seminars about Indonesian foreign policy and uh, Indonesian economic policy. I think uh, CSIS has always been able to give us uh, uh, an alternative view, a different view, objective one. And uh, I would like to thank CSIS uh, for that. Um, I have uh, uh, an experience as a diplomat, as a civil servant, in uh, different settings, in bilateral settings, Germany and Portugal, in uh, regional setting, ambassador to European Union, and also at multilateral setting, uh, my first assignment in UN headquarters in Geneva. So uh, from all these experiences, what I feel, uh, what I extract is that any uh, discussions or uh, decisions at global level, UN, G20, um, and, and, and the like of it, uh, will only be or can only be done uh, in, in, in the field, in the reality, uh, through a number of bilateral uh, uh, initiative. So I, I, believe, I believe in that uh, situations, uh, conditions very well. And I think uh, the context of this discussion today fits in that thinking as well. So uh, yes, Indonesia will be the president of G20 and Germany will be 
the president of G7, but the bilateral bond between Germany and Indonesia as two natural strategic uh, country and strategic partners uh, will play a very important role in implementing many of those uh, policies that came out uh, from, from G20. I have been saying in my uh, assignment here in Germany that Indonesia and Germany is a natural uh, partners in a strategic uh, event and strategic importance because uh, what is actually the nature of Germany and Indonesia. Uh, both countries are the founder of the regional uh, organizations, in Germany, one of the founder of the EU, Indonesia, one of the founder of the ASEAN. Both are the uh, largest uh, countries in terms of area, in terms of population, in terms of economy in their own respective regions. Uh, Germany is so in Europe, Indonesia is so in uh, Southeast Asia. And also um, Indonesia and, and Germany, uh, we play a very important role in the regional aspect of our um, economy and uh, politics as well. So that uh, national aspect is uh, an ingredient for uh, Indonesia and Germany to uh, push different agenda at the global level at G20 and as well as at the different uh, aspect of international relations. The theme, of course, it's a very important one, recover together and recover stronger. And uh, the element that are going to be uh, put in, in, in the attention is uh, health environment and, and the economy. But again, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, without bilateral strength, uh, many of the global policy will not uh, matter at all. I'll give you an example. I went to see Bosch uh, with our Minister of Industry just last week. <clears throat> he is talking about um, uh, semiconductors uh, 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 situations in the world. And I thought it was just because of uh, COVID. No, it's not. Uh, it is because of winter in Texas. So uh, a semiconductor company in Texas uh, was not functioning well. Earthquake in Japan, another semiconductor uh, uh, factory was not functioning well. And COVID in Malaysia, okay. And also the third, the fourth one, the fact that apparently, apparently the only country that produced the machine to make semiconductor is the Netherlands. It's the only country in the world. And the United States uh, puts pressures on the Netherlands not to export that machine, that engine to China. So it's whether we have a global discussion on this, but at the end of the day, it's the bilateral and geopolitics that play a role. So I think uh, with uh, Indonesia's positions, uh, with the German positions uh, today, uh, and I hope uh, the new government in Germany will also look at this uh, uh, issue in a, in a most uh, a great importance. We will we will hopefully be able to become a bridge a bridge builder, you know, a, a, a gap builder between geopolitical situations in East Asia, uh, in Asia, and as well as. Uh, what I have learned from many colleagues in, in Germany that Germany wants to have independent foreign policy on China, independent from the United States. So the same with Indonesia as well. So this is this is a one looming giant elephant in the room, which is the geopolitics uh, in all of these uh, different uh, uh, settings. On the issue of environment, for instance, I'm I'm here in Glasgow today, and I'm I'm, I'm going to speak on different issue. But I'm going to speak on carbon issue. I'm going to speak on mangrove. I'm going to speak on infrastructure. But why I am here, because those issues were basically a, an issue that we agree bilaterally, Indonesia and Germany, uh, to build uh, regionally and in Indonesia. So we have signed an agreement with Germany uh, for KFW Bank to bring 
2.3 billion euros uh, to Indonesia on green infrastructure uh, initiative. So yes, you can have big discussions on financings of environment, but at the end of the day, it's bilateral that play a very important role. We know that the so-called pledge of 100 billion uh, euro is being postponed, but uh, ways to, to, to get uh, financing, I think is also very important. And this is very, very important aspect. I want to point out that Indonesia and Germany, uh, we have this arrangement that we are going to launch today with Palukot here in, in Glasgow. Uh, Indonesia and Germany agrees on establishing the World Micro Center. Uh, the president will open uh, probably next year. Location will be in Bali. And why mangrove? Uh, and why Indonesia and Germany? Indonesia is the largest uh, mangrove forest in the world. Uh, Germany has keen interest on the environment, of course. And of course, we have some expert on mangrove in Germany as well. So uh, we are going to create a world mangrove center. So a contribution of Indonesia and Germany together uh, at the global level on the environment issue. Uh, carbon issue, of course, we have just signed Indonesian carbon uh, trading uh, law and it will develop into carbon market. And of course, uh, German industries are very much interested in getting carbon offset from Indonesia. Again, this is an example that you have, we have to be, we have to put our feet on the ground when we talk about uh, multilateralism. It is very important to have a global understanding, a global arrangement, if possible, global legally binding uh, obligations. But if not, then maybe at least as some arrangement and understanding, uh, like what we have in G20, because G20 is not legally binding organization. But at the end of the day, it's the bilateral relations uh, that will make a real difference. So I think in this context, I would like to close that the uh, annual discussions between KIS and CSIS uh, really adds up the value of bilateral relations between Indonesia and Germany, uh, provides a different uh, way of looking at things that uh, hopefully will produce into recommendations that can be uh, provided to the government. And of course, uh, you have uh, Pa Suminto here, of course, for instance, and uh, you know you can, you can uh, give your recommendation to him uh, and also other colleagues, of course, uh, in the government who might be uh, in this uh, discussion today. So once again, uh, congratulations, uh, uh, Mr. Senker, uh, Philip, for organizing this event. And uh, also uh, regards to all the speakers and also uh, Ambassador Ina Lapel, a good friend of mine. I've known uh, Ambassador Ina ooh, more than five years now. <laughs> so it's a long time friend. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for your speech, Ambassador Ugrozeno. And now I would like to invite Ambassador Ina Lapel to give her speech. Ambassador Ina Lapel is the current ambassador designate of the Federal Republic of Germany to Indonesia, ASEAN, and Timor-Leste. She took office in Ger German's Federal Foreign Office since 1990 and was previously appointed as the German ambassador to Japan before, before, she, before she was coming all the way to Jakarta. And she was also the German ambassador to Pakistan. She holds a bachelor and master degree in economics from Bonn University, German and Germany in and Indiana University in United States. So without further ado, uh, ambassador and uh, without further ado, I would like to invite Ambassador Lapel. Ambassador Lapel, you may have the screen. Terima kasih. Selamat siang. Your Excellency Arifazas Ograseno, thank you very much for your kind words. Distinguished Executive Director Vermonte, Distinguished Executive Director Senkir, Distinguished Speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Today, it is my great pleasure to attend the fifth German-Indonesian Strategic Dialogue of the Center for Strategic and International Studies and the Konrad Anwar Stiftung for the first time for myself. This platform I have learned is an outstanding opportunity to exchange ideas and experiences between our two countries 
and bring together governments, civil society, academia, business community, and many more. Before I begin, allow me to also congratulate the CSIS on its golden jubilee that you celebrated last year. In the past 50 years, the CSIS played an instrumental role in contributing evidence-based politics policies that benefit the government, the private sector, and civil society. Congratulations once again, and all the best for your future. In 2022, Indonesia will hold the G20 presidency for the first time. A debut in different difficult times as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to pose a critical challenge to the world community. The pandemic has triggered the deepest economic recession in nearly a century, threatening health, disrupting economic activities, endangering jobs. It is transforming the way we think about our economies and our societies. The policy choices governments make today will determine their success in building a transition to a greener, more inclusive, and more resilient tomorrow. That is why we welcome the decision of the Indonesian government to put the economic global recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic at the heart of its G20 agenda under the guiding theme, recover together, recover stronger. It will be one of the main challenges for the G20 to find ways to alleviate the repercussions of the pandemic and to boost an equitable, resilient, and productive economic global recovery. The G20 is often criticized for failing the hope that it would be the accelerator of the global pandemic recovery and for seemingly being incapable of mitigating the crisis. However, Germany is firmly convinced that things would be worse without this format and that the G20 is the right platform to define a way forward. It comprises about 65% of global population, about 80% of global GDP, and about 75% of global trade. The G20 can foster the kind of cooperation that is urgently required these days to tackle global challenges and to create a better future for all. For Indonesia, the G20 presidency will serve as a unique opportunity to display its leadership to the world. However, global economic recovery is a complex undertaking. It is a challenge and it is an opportunity to leave the hardships of the pandemic behind and recover even stronger. In addition, it can only succeed if we interlink recovery with the most urgent global challenges of our times, climate change, global health, and digital transformation. Let me briefly outline my thoughts. Firstly, it is a global reality that climate change is underway. Droughts, floods, and fires around the globe illustrate its severe impacts. Moreover, those impacts do neither stop at borders nor differentiate between rich and poor regions. Since yesterday, world leaders are gathering at the COP26 climate summit in Glasgow to take action to secure global net zero by mid-century and keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target within reach. I am confident that during these negotiations, we will make progress on some of the outstanding issues of the Paris Agreement and prove that COP26 is about fairness, reliable partnerships, and trust, the most important building blocks in global climate policy. In addition, we believe that GD20 needs to provide the necessary collaboration and leadership to fight climate change. It is of utmost importance that the G20 reiterate their commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement and implement their national climate targets as swiftly as possible. Our joint efforts to reconcile climate protection action and economic recovery will be essential to ensure resilient and sustainable global recovery. Germany stands ready to support the Indonesian G20 presidency on this pressing, pressing issue. Secondly, the pandemic showed that we need stronger international health cooperation. Local outbreaks, epidemics can very quickly become global and jeopardize the overall stability of the global economy. We need a better alignment of the various standards regarding health protocols and vaccination records. 
we need better mechanisms to anticipate future pandemics at an early stage and establish effective and appropriate measures to prevent further damage. Finally, yet importantly, we need more exchange between our national, national health sectors to share knowledge and increase the resilience. The G20 will need to play a role in supporting a fair global vaccine distribution. As the second largest donor for COVAX, Germany shares the value of solidarity with Indonesia. With our contribution of 2.6 billion US dollars since the beginning of the pandemic, more than 320 million doses of vaccines were administered worldwide. Thirdly, digital transformation is, the driver, is a driver of globalization. Half of the world's population has access to the internet. There is hardly any company which does not rely on it for its business. Integrated value change, industry 4.0, e-commerce, social networks and platforms mean that the world is coming ever closer together. Therefore, Germany hosted the first digital ministers meeting ever to take place during our last G20 presidency in 2017. We are happy that Indonesia continues this initiative. If we want to make full use of the opportunities provided by digitalization for the benefit of all people, we will need a joint international framework of, for action that establishes the fundamental principles of digital policy, such as transparency, legal certainty, and level playing field. In the final analysis, we cannot talk about global recovery without taking digitalization as the key driving force for future economic growth into account. Germany is very excited that our Indonesian partners put all these topics on their G20 agenda. It shows that Indonesia and Germany share key values, as well as the belief in inclusivity, solidarity, and multilateralism. As Germany will take over the G7 presidency in 2022, we are convinced that our partnership is a fertile soil for a strong G20, G7 cooperation, and will enable us to find common ground on the most urgent global challenges. Let me conclude by reiterating that Germany stands ready to support Indonesia in its G20 preparations. We are looking forward to cooperate closely with our Indonesian partners, and we are firmly convinced that Indonesia's G20 presidency will have a lasting effect on global recovery. Thank you very much for your attention. Terima kasih. Thank you for your wonderful speech, Ambassador Lepel. And now we have come to the beginning of today's session. Our first session today will be moderated by Ms. Felipa Amanta, Head of Research at the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies. Ms. Felipa Amanta, in her spare time, she mentors young policy leaders in Think, in Think Policy Indonesia. And, previ and previously, she conducted research in the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, without taking more of your time, I invite Ms. Felipa to start the session. So Ms. Felipa, the screen is yours. Thank you so much, Ms. Sheila. Good afternoon to everyone in Indonesia and good morning or good morning to those joining us um, from Germany. And a special hello, good afternoon and good morning to Ambassador Arif Hafas, Ambassador Inala Pell, Dr. Phillips, and also Dr. Jen Senker. Thank you very much for setting the context for our discussion today. Um, and before we start, I'd just like to wish a very happy birthday to CSIS. Congratulations to 50 years of contributing to ideas and policies in Indonesia. And here we are contributing to that tradition with today's discussion, continuing the discussion on ideas and policies, especially related to next year's G20. Um, I'm Felipa Amanta from the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies, and I'm very delighted to be moderating the session today on engaging an equal, resilient, and productive global economic recovery through the G20 as part of the fifth KAS CSIS Germany Indonesia Strategic Dialogue. Thank you very much to CSIS and thank you to Konrad Adenauer Stiftung for the invitation of this dialogue. All right, so let's just get started right into the dialogue. Um, as we all know, the G20 summit under Italy's presidency has just ended two days ago. So we're immediately looking ahead to next year 
where it will be Indonesia's turn to host. The G20 will be happening in a very challenging time, as previous speakers have acknowledged, as the world is still reeling from the health and economic crisis of the COVID-19 pandemic and disruptions in global trade and supply chain. And all of this is compounded by the ongoing climate crisis that is already threatening people's livelihood at the moment. So amidst these challenges, a sustainable economic recovery will still be a key priority, as emphasized in next year's theme. Recover together, recover stronger. But how exactly can we achieve this inclusive global recovery is the big question. Climate change, supply chain disruptions, and trade tensions are currently disproportionately affecting developing countries who are at the same time facing vaccine distribution and health infrastructure inequities, which are all exacerbating the uneven recovery. So to address all of these challenges, Currently, we will just be highlighting several priority issues today. First, we'll be talking about the establishment of a reliable and inclusive global trade and supply chains. Second, we will also be talking about even global vaccine distribution, especially through channels like COVAX. And lastly, we'll also be talking about financial support and debt restructuring initiative from the G20 to help developing and low-income countries to mitigate and recover from the pandemic. In addition, for today, we'll also be talking about how Indonesia and Germany can cooperate, especially in sharing knowledge for the promotion of an even global economic recovery through trade, health, and developmental aspects. And joining us today to answer these big questions and to unpack the opportunities and challenges towards global economic recovery through the areas of trade, vaccine, and financing through G20 are joining us with three esteemed panelists. First, we have Dr. Suminto, Assistant of Minister for Financial Sector Policy and Secretary of Financial System Stability Committee from the Ministry of Finance, Republic of Indonesia. Hello, Dr. Suminto. Yeah, um, um, we also have Dr. Yose Rizal Damuri, Head of Department of Economics, Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia, who is also the co-chair of T20 Indonesia. Hello, Pak Yose. Selamat siang. Hello, Felipa. Selamat siang. And last but not least, we also have Dr. Patrick Ziegenhain, Associate Professor at the Department of International Relations at President University Indonesia. Hello. Good afternoon, Patrick. Hello. Good afternoon. Selamat siang. Selamat siang. Um, each of our speakers today will have about 20 minutes each to share their perspective on the way forward to global economic recovery through the G20, through the three priority issues of trade, health, and also financing. And at the end, we'll also have time for question and answer. So I would also like to invite our audience today. We want to hear from you. So feel free to post your questions at any point during the webinar, either in the Q&A box below if you're joining from Zoom, or you can also put it in the chat box in YouTube and we'll be asking it during our Q&A session later. All right, I'm sure we're all quite excited for today's discussion. So without further ado, let me invite our first speaker, Dr. Suminto. Dr. Suminto is Assistant of Minister for Financial Sector Policy and Secretary of Financial System Stability Committee at the Ministry of Finance, Republic of Indonesia. Dr. Suminto has had a long track record working in government previously acting as Assistant Finance Minister for Macroeconomy and International Finance, as well as Assistant Finance Minister for Government Expenditure. He is also acted as G20 Finance De Deputy from 2019 to 2021, and he currently also sits at the board in several agencies, including Indonesia's Exim Bank and National Social Security Council. So, Dr. Suminto, the Zoom is yours. Terima kasih, uh, Felipa. Uh, selamat uh, pagi, selamat siang, all of colleague, um, excellencies, uh, Ambassador uh, Arif Hafas uh, Ugrasino, uh, Ambassador uh, Ina Lepel, uh, Dr. Philip, uh, Mr. Yang Sengkir, and then also our colleague, uh, Dr. Yusrizal, and also uh, Associate Professor Dr. Patrick. Uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is uh, my privilege to be invited in this uh, important event. Uh, in this uh, session, I mainly will uh, share with all of you uh, the 
uh, proposed agenda of the next year Indonesia G20 presidency, especially in the uh, finance uh, track side. If all of you are aware that um, the uh, G20 agenda will be uh, divided into uh, two main uh, tracks, that is uh, Sherpa tracks and finance track. In respect to the uh, finance track uh, agenda, uh, we appreciate and welcome some important uh, deliverables from the uh, current uh, pre uh, presidency, uh, Italia, uh, Italy, in which uh, we uh, just uh, conducted the uh, G20 summit uh, last week. In the uh, finance, uh, finance uh, track side, uh, some important deliverables from the uh, Italy presidency uh, could be uh, shared with you, in which we welcome and appreciate. Firstly, uh, um, we do believe that uh, Italian presidency was successfully in uh, addressing uh, the uh, pandemic uh, to ensure uh, once again uh, the important role of the G20 as the uh, crisis responder. Uh, in respect to the uh, supporting the vulnerable economies, we uh, uh, to understand that under the Italian presidency, the G20 continued and supporting the low-income countries, uh, firstly, in respect to the uh, debt issues in which we continue the debt uh, service uh, suspension initiative, and also start to operationalize the common framework for debt uh, treatment uh, beyond, the, uh, beyond the DSSI to allow the low-income countries uh, to use their lim uh, limited resources for uh, vaccine procurement as well as to handle uh, pandemic uh, related expenditures. And also to uh, increase the capacity of the low income countries uh, in uh, procuring uh, vaccine as well as uh, 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 meeting the expenditures on uh, health, uh, social security, also supporting their businesses. Uh, G20 uh, supported the IMF uh, in uh, conducting the uh, allocation of the HDR in the month of 650 billion US dollar distribu uh, distributed proportionally uh, quota, uh, quota based to all member countries. Of course, especially for the low income countries, uh, low income countries, uh, it is very uh, useful uh, for uh, supporting their financing needs. Uh, we also encourage the advanced countries receiving uh, more SDR allocation to uh, re a channel of their uh, SDR allocations to the uh, low income countries. Uh, either through the poverty reduction and uh, growth facilities or uh, through the new established uh, platform uh, that is the Resilient uh, Trust. And also the G20 encourages the multilateral development banks to constantly increase their capacity in providing financing support to developing economies and uh, low-income uh, countries. Um, with uh, this um, support, it is expected that the low-income countries uh, could uh, afford and the uh, vaccine as well as and the financing need in handling the current uh, severe uh, and devastating uh, uh, pandemic. Secondly, uh, in respect to the uh, vaccine uh, procurement, as we do understand that the G20 uh, has launched the uh, ACTA, uh, Access to uh, COVID-19 Tool accelerator, Accelerators with uh, its uh, uh, vaccine pillar, that is a COVAX facility, 
uh, invest uh, through this uh, platform and uh, also uh, with the effort in uh, mobilizing uh, financing, um, it will allow us to distribute around 1.8 billion doses of vaccine to developing uh, economies and low-income countries with uh, full subsidy. Uh, hopefully, it, uh, it will uh, support uh, global uh, society uh, in uh, meeting the, uh, the vaccination uh, need. It is expected that uh, by in the end of this year, 40% uh, 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 of the total global population will be vaccinated and 70% of the total global population will be vaccinated before uh, the end of the first semester of next year. Also, another important deliverables of the Italian presidency is the uh, reactivating uh, and establishing uh, the uh, sustainable finance study group and then uh, upgraded into the sustainable finance working group. Uh, in ways, uh, the, the working group has uh, produce the sustainable finance uh, or roadmap. It is a multi-year uh, roadmap uh, providing um, direction how the G20 will continue a discussion on the uh, sustainable finance issues and uh, supporting uh, uh, orderly and just transition to the uh, greener and low uh, carbon uh, economy. Um, the, the important uh, deliverables of the Italian presidency is the establishment of the G20 high level independent panel to conduct uh, study and provide recommendations how uh, the uh, global society could uh, 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 have a better uh, preparedness uh, and uh, could prevent uh, another uh, pandemic uh, in the future. Uh, one of the important result of the uh, recommendation of the high-level independent panel is the establishment of the uh, joint uh, finance and health uh, task force uh, that will be co-chaired by the uh, Italy and Indonesia in ways um, this task force will uh, provide uh, study uh, how to uh, build uh, 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 an, a good uh, platform in respect to the pandemic uh, prevention, preparedness and response. And uh, this will be uh, reported to the uh, finance and health ministries uh, by uh, February uh, next year. Another important uh, deliverables is the uh, consensus on the uh, digital uh, taxation in which under the G20 OECD uh, inclusive framework uh, supported uh, fully by the G20, uh, we, uh, could to the reach, uh, we could reach to the consensus on the pillar one and the pillar two on the digital taxation in ways it will allow us, the uh, global economy, to have uh, additional, uh, uh, additional taxation uh, revenue. Uh, according to the OECD, uh, the uh, consensus on Pillar 1 will provide an additional revenue in the amount of uh, around uh, 250 uh, billion US dollar a year and uh, for the pillar one, it will uh, provide another uh, uh, potential revenue in amount of 225 uh, billion US dollar. Of course, uh, this will support the uh, economies uh, in uh, not only handling the uh, pandemic, but also in supporting the recovery from the current uh, uh, pandemic. And uh, another important uh, deliverables is a G20 infrastructure investor dialogue uh, in which one of in, in, uh, important uh, discussion result 
is a discussion on the uh, infrastructure uh, supporting to the uh, transition. This is some uh, important deliverables from the uh, G20 Italian presidency, especially in the uh, finance rec. It is uh, via uh, Indonesian uh, next year presidency are ready uh, to continue the agenda, of course, in respect to the uh, convention in the G20, uh, we will continue the, leg and the legacy agenda in one side and in another side, and, and in another side as a presidency, we will have uh, some uh, priority agenda or flexit agenda that is uh, kind of the combination uh, between the uh, legacy and the new, uh, the new initiative. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, as has been uh, referred by uh, many of the uh, previous speakers that uh, 2022 is expected to uh, be a recovery year for a global economy uh, after the uh, devastating current, uh, current devastating pandemic. Uh, in this respect, and the Indonesian uh, presidency uh, team will be recover uh, together, uh, together uh, recover stronger. Recover together mean uh, that we have aspiration that all countries will uh, recover together, uh, no uh, country left behind. One important ingredient to ensure this uh, talk, uh, togetherness and recovery is how uh, we could coordinate and harmonize our exit policy from the current extraordinary policies in handling the pandemic, either uh, fiscal, uh, monetary, also on the uh, financial uh, sector uh, side. And the second uh, aspect of the team is uh, recover stronger in which it represents the aspiration that in the post pandemic era, the global economy will be stronger and could achieve a strong, uh, sustainable, inclusive and balanced as well as resilient uh, growth. Um, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, to be able to recover uh, together, recover stronger, we uh, do realize that some uh, pillar should be established. Firstly, is promoting productivity and economic efficiency. Secondly, increasing resilience and stability of the uh, financial and uh, monetary uh, sites. And uh, thirdly, is uh, answering the sustainable and inclusive growth. These pillars uh, should be supported by uh, uh, stronger uh, collective global leadership, as well as enabling environments and partnership. In this respect, we do hope that under the uh, Indonesian presidency, uh, we could build a strong leadership of G20 in steering the global agenda in supporting the economic recovery. Our aspiration is the Indonesian uh, presidency would like to provide evidence that after the G20 effectively uh, performing a role as a, a crisis responder in the post-crisis, the G20 could uh, perform uh, a role as the uh, steering committee, steering committee of the economic recovery and economic reform in the post uh, pandemic era to bring all of us to a strong, uh, sustainable, inclusive, uh, balanced and resilient uh, global economy. To uh, reflect this aspiration, the Indonesian presidency, uh, especially in the finance track, has identified some priority agenda. 
Firstly, uh, exit strategy to uh, support recovery. And secondly, addressing uh, scaring effects to save your future growth. That is briefly I have mentioned earlier. Uh, thirdly, a payment system in the digital era. This is uh, in line with the uh, agenda on digitalization as has been mentioned by some of the previous uh, speakers. And then uh, sustainable finance and climate related agenda. And then uh, financial inclusion and international taxation. I will briefly uh, share with you uh, in uh, respect to this uh, priority uh, agenda of the uh, Indonesia uh, uh, presidency. Um, Dr. See. Suminto, you yeah. have about five minutes left. Thank okay, you. I will uh, try uh, uh, to use effectively this remaining five <laughs> minutes. Yeah, firstly, uh, securing a stable exit from the pandemic uh, is a priority for uh, policymakers. Uh, to answer the, uh, the togetherness in the, in the recovery. Uh, you know that we have uh, experience with taper tantrum. Uh, it is uh, the important lesson for us that the coordinated and harmonized exit policy from the uh, current extraordinary initiatives is very much important. Otherwise, we will have uh, another uh, experience similar with the taper tantrum back to the 2013, in which the exit from the extraordinary measures in handling the global financial crisis was less coordinated and harmonized. Uh, secondly, in respect to the uh, scaring effect, we do understand that the pandemic, uh, health crisis evolving uh, to the uh, financial and economic crisis has caused what so called a scaring effect. There is a need, uh, what so called uh, uh, appropriate uh, handling to uh, uh, to uh, overcome this uh, scaring effect. Uh, important among important uh, ingredient in handling this scaring effect from the pandemic is how to uh, promote the a productivity and efficiency supported by the digitalization and also uh, human capital. So that it is uh, among the important issues uh, to be discussed under the Indonesia uh, presidency. And then uh, in respect to the sustainable finance and uh, uh, climate related uh, agenda, uh, we will uh, continue the current discussion and uh, start to implement the sustainable uh, finance roadmap. And in the transition uh, side, the Indonesia uh, uh, constantly uh, promote the principle of affordability in the transition. So if the current jargon in the G20 is um, an orderly and uh, just transition, we uh, uh, constantly uh, promote an other important principle, this is affordability, so that we would like to see the affordable, uh, just, and orderly transition to the uh, net zero emission uh, economies. And then in respect to the uh, payment system uh, agenda, we will uh, discuss uh, some issues, including uh, cross-border payment, uh, digital currency, and also uh, central bank digital currency. We uh, already have a discussion with the FSB uh, to exercise the discussion on the central bank uh, digital currency, especially in provide a principle or a guidance prin uh, principle uh, of the uh, central bank digital currency to guide us in discussing this important uh, development in the uh, payment uh, in the payment uh, system, and then in the financial inclusion, uh, we will continue the agenda on the global uh, partnership uh, financial inclusion in ways uh, under the uh, current um, uh, roadmap. We will 
uh, prioritize the discussion on the digitalization and how the uh, digital could support the SMEs. And uh, finally, in the international taxation, we will continue the agenda on the digital taxation, especially in ensuring on the uh, uh, in, uh, infrastructure and regulation needed by countries to implement the consensus of the pillar one and pillar, uh, pillar two. And we also uh, would uh, promote the discussion on the domestic resource mobilization to ensure that the economies, especially developing countries and low-income countries could uh, mobilize uh, uh, resources to support their uh, recovery. And uh, some uh, other uh, related uh, issues regarding to uh, taxation will be discussed, including the tax uh, transparency and tax incentive uh, mechanism. So this is uh, some uh, important and priority agenda of the finance track under the Indonesian presidency next year. And of course, apart from that, as has been mentioned, that we will continue uh, some important legend, uh, leg legacy agenda, uh, including uh, global risk uh, monitoring and surveillance, uh, global financial safety net, uh, improving capital flows, data gap initiative, financial sector regulation reform, debt sustainability and transparency, and also another uh, important agenda that has been uh, mentioned by all of the uh, previous uh, uh, speakers is uh, in the health and finance uh, issues in which uh, we will continue our works in uh, overcoming the health issues, especially in preparing the world uh, with a better uh, preparedness to the uh, pandemic through the uh, current task force has been established and will be co-chaired by Indonesia and Italy. Uh, I will stop here, uh, Felipa. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Suminto, for that very comprehensive introduction to Indonesia's T20 agenda, especially in the finance track. I won't repeat what has been said because it's very rich with details in terms of what Indonesia's legacy agendas are from the current presidency and also what new priority agendas um, Indonesia will be setting. So I think this is really good context for our discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Suminto. Um, and next, we will hear from Dr. Yoseri Saljamuri, Head of Department of Economics, CSIS Indonesia, who is also the co-chair of D20 Indonesia. His research activities focus on international trade, digital integration, and globalization of value chain. He is currently active in several research and advisory networks, both in Indonesia and East Asia, such as the Indonesia Services Dialogue and Asia Pacific Research and Training Network on Trade. Uh, Jose also teaches international economics courses at the Faculty of Economics, University of Indonesia. So Dr. Jose, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Velipa, uh, uh, for the introduction, very kind introductions. Uh, a very good morning to uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ari, Arifa Fasu Greseno, uh, His Excellency Inaleva, Mr. Jansen Kier, my colleague Philip Permonte, Pak Suminto, apa kabar Pak? Moga baik. Uh, <laughs> Pak Patrick uh, uh, Ziegenlein uh, and all distinguished participants uh, of this uh, forum. Uh, it is very an honor for me to be able to uh, participate again uh, in this uh, CAS CSIS uh, uh, annual dialogue, the German. Germany Indonesia strategic dialogue. Uh, it's uh, uh, and uh, today we're going to talk or discuss about uh, G20 and also Indonesia's presidency uh, in the G uh, G20. Um, it, it is really a good topic to choose, in my opinion, uh, because uh, and also very important one because as we know that the economic cooperations is really needed. Uh, especially during the time of crisis like uh, like what we have today uh, and uh, 
uh, and a G20 actually one of the uh, most appropriate for platforms uh, in order to push forward and to uh, even to uh, uh, to promote uh, international cooperations, especially in dealing with the crisis. I would like to share uh, uh, some presentations. It's where it's a um, uh, uh, short, uh, a very short presentations, just to give my my point of view uh, to send my point of view clear. Um, it's. Um, uh, it, it, we will talk uh, uh, a little bit about what we are uh, still dealing, uh, especially with the, the crisis, and what is the roles of G20, and how these roles of G20 can be a serpent and can be promoted, especially during the presidency of uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, as I mentioned before, the, during the crisis, actually that's the times where uh, when the international economic cooperation is needed. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the UN Secretary General, uh, Antonio Guterres. Uh, he, he mentions about uh, the demand, the uh, increasing demand of coordinated, decisive, and innovative policy actions from the world's leading economies. Uh, he, was, uh, he said that uh, 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 on March 19, 2020, or more than one and a half years ago. But until now, what we've seen is that uh, we don't really have sufficient international cooperation in dealing with the crisis. We can see it, for example, especially with uh, the, 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 on the, uh, the issue of vaccinations. This is still a very long and winding road for many countries in the, uh, in the world. Uh, you can see from the from the map uh, on the left that uh, most of the um, most of the um, the uh, countries in uh, Africa the, the the color of, uh, of this vaccination rate uh, is still very light, meaning that they don't uh, uh, they only have around uh, thirty doses have been uh, inoculated to the population for 100 population, less than 30 doses. Even many countries has, has still uh, have less than 10 doses. Uh, the, while while uh, we know that in order to have, uh, to have a, a fully coverage, uh, at least we're going to have 160 doses per 100 uh, population or even more. Uh, so uh, this is still very big problems. Uh, and we, we still need to have more international cooperations on this issue. Uh, uh, we we already seen uh, the the in, uh, good international cooperations on research and development of the vaccines, but it's not enough. We have to go much more beyond that research and development cooperations. We also need to go for the production and manufacturing one. Uh, uh, for your uh, uh, as an information, vaccine has never been. A, a big a major part of pharmaceutical industry. It's only very little part of pharmaceutical industry, uh, especially during uh, uh, during the normal time. So there, uh, there is the uh, production facilities is very very far from sufficient. In order to uh, to have a, a, a sufficient amount of vaccines, we need to push for greater uh, cooperations, especially uh, uh, in multiplying the productions uh, of vaccines. Currently, the, the production of vaccines is around nine billion dollar. Uh, sorry, nine billion uh, doses per year. But still, it's uh, it's still not enough to cover all uh, uh, all the uh, uh, the current populations of seven almost 7.2 uh, billion uh, uh, people around the world. Of course, we, uh, uh, when we're still uh, trying to uh, improve the production, we need to talk about distribution and access. Currently, some, some countries are still hoarding the vaccines, while others do not even have sufficient number of, uh, of vaccine uh, doses in their country. We still need to find an innovative way to deal with distribution and access to at least the available uh, dosage of vaccines. 
this is actually just one of the issue that we were still facing at the moment. Uh, we also still need, uh, we also uh, uh, still look at that the, uh, for many countries, many economies, recovery remain unclear. Uh, the, uh, that's, that also related actually to the, to the uh, un uneven vaccinations and uh, un uh, uneven uh, uh, access to vaccine. Um, uh, the, the IMF just recently uh, released their project uh, projections for the next uh, two years, the, uh, the uh, economy, global economy for the next two or three years uh, until 2024. And one way to look at it is to look at uh, what if the pandemic uh, did not uh, present and uh, uh, compared to the current pro projections. With, the, with that, we can see that the uh, advanced economies actually manage to uh, surpass the pre-pandemic forecast in 2022, meaning that they already uh, they already in a good way in uh, to, uh, for the recovery. While for the emerging countries, uh, especially emerging countries outside China, uh, the, the the situation remained below its pandemic forecast in 2020, even in 2024. It's still four percent below the uh, the uh, if. There, uh, there was no pandemic. Uh, uh, there was no pandemic. The situation is still is still uh, uncertain for them. And more worryingly, low-income countries, especially those who did not uh, receive enough vaccinations, would be 10% lower compared the situations without pandemic. So we, uh, uh, this is still a big problems that require uh, a, a greater economic cooperations uh, at the global level because. Uh, uh, this uh, uneven recovery would also uh, uh, put a lot of risk or, or higher risk to the, the to the economy and the recovery itself, especially in terms of uh, uh, financial sectors and financial markets and uh, uh, and uh, macroeconomic policy. Uh, it would also worsen the, the situations. Uh, of debt stress, uh, where the global public debt is projected to reach a record high level of 100% of GDP in 2021. Uh, and uh, while uh, on the other hand, the risk from corporate debts are, are also on the rise. So uh, uh, these kind of things uh, put a lot of pressures uh, to the uh, uh, financial sectors uh, and the macro, uh, macroeconomic policy uh, globally. We cannot, uh, as Pasuminto mentioned, we have to uh, deal with that. Or also, we have to prepare an exit strategy, an appropriate exit strategy that would wouldn't uh, that uh, that this uh, that less disturbing uh, to the, uh, 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 the to the process of recovery, uh, and also would not uh, be um, uh, would not uh, be damaging. Uh, especially to the emerging and low-income countries. Yeah. Uh, another issue that uh, also require uh, more uh, global cooperation uh, is on trade and connectivity. It is uh, still uh, uh, be, uh, become a very serious problem. Uh, uh, on the left side, you, you can see that the trade has been advancing actually uh, since the end of last year uh, and uh, keep uh, advancing so far. But the uh, logistics become a very serious problem. You can see on the right, the, the freight costs uh, uh, actually already exceeded or, or already uh, increased by 200, almost 250 percent since before the crisis. Uh, and it, uh, it would be very damaging uh, to the prospects of recovery uh, and the prospect of connectivity. Another side of connectivity is people to people mobility. Uh, the uh, people mobility and travel arrangements. We uh, we've seen that the uh, the global uh, governance, global order, even until now, cannot come up with a harmonious procedure for safe and but efficient travel arrangement. One country has different procedure, has different uh, certification, has different requirement uh, to enter and to exit uh, uh, from that country. Uh, uh, some countries already allow uh, more uh, uh, greater 
movements while other remain to be restricted. So we cannot do, uh, if we want to have a, a stronger recovery, we, we cannot have this kind of situations. It also needs to be done at the global level while uh, where G20 also have a very a, a good position in order to push, in order to promote that kind of harmonization of safe, uh, uh, safe but efficient travel arrangement. So with that uh, kind of uh, situations in the background, uh, in my opinion, uh, 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 Indonesia presidency in G20 is, has a really uh, important and strategic uh, uh, position. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, G20 so far hasn't really come up with a uh, sufficient uh, plan of actions uh, during the last two years of economic crisis. G20, as we know, uh, was born uh, during the crisis and it was actually a response uh, to crisis uh, situation. Uh, in 2008, uh, 2007, 2008, for example, the G20 summit really uh, was was really successful in dealing with the crisis in responding to the crisis to the crisis with fiscal coordinations with uh, commit commitments uh, toward uh, against protectionisms that would uh, in rise at that times uh, uh, and it uh, uh, basically the G20 managed to uh, to maintain the situations under control but of course uh, during, uh, after the crisis already becomes uh, becomes uh, uh, less worrying uh, G20 need to come up with a new idea and new rules. That's why G20 uh, evolved into economic governance and agenda setting forum. While it is very important and it's also beneficial to the economic governance, global economic governance, it be, makes the G20, in my opinion, to become too fat and cannot respond to the crisis cannot respond to the uh, uh, situations effectively and efficiently. So that's why even during the last two years, we cannot, we uh, rarely see that uh, G20 act plan of uh, action plans uh, optimally uh, push or optimally promote international cooperations to deal with the pandemic and the crisis. Uh, there are still a lot of, uh, a lot of, aspects that G20 actually can play more important role, but uh, the, the G20 miss the momentum and miss the opportunity. As you can see, like uh, uh, this year, uh, G20, the, 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 uh, the theme is people, planet, and prosperity. It didn't even say anything about the crisis. Yeah. While uh, Indonesia's a green theme, I think, is more appropriate to the current situation. Recover together, recover stronger. It means that uh, Indonesia also put this crisis uh, into an, a, a priority, an appropriate priority, where, where it deems more attention uh, uh, in the priority agenda. But of course, it depends again on how Indonesia would drive the process into that recovery. Uh, Suminto mentions about the legacy agenda. The legacy agenda, while it is important, also has a potential to distract the attention toward the, 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 uh, the more important uh, uh, issues uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, make, the, uh, make the, uh, the G20 members less focused on those important issues. Uh, but, uh, and again, and also uh, you can see that uh, G20 members have different uh, interests, very diverse interests. Well, some countries already in uh, uh, good track of uh, recovery, they might not see that the uh, uh, efforts toward recovery as important uh, a point, uh, as important agenda, while others, uh, such as even Indonesia, for example, uh, remain to see that uh, uh, recovery remain to be unclear and we still need to pay more attention on the recovery process. These two, uh, these things would make uh, the, uh, the situations more interesting for sure, uh, but also challenging for Indonesia. 
especially when we're talking about international cooperation, we also seen a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, issues uh, surrounding that uh, from the uh, lack of trust between between one country to another, uh, also incre uh, increasing tension, especially as we know uh, between China and between the US, for example. Uh, 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 this week or last week in Italy, we've seen that uh, President Putin and President Xi Jinping did, uh, uh, did not appear or did not come to the, uh, to the G20 summit. Uh, it also sent a signal that the, the increasing tension is real. Uh, and it would become a, a, another challenge to Indonesia to reconcile those different uh, uh, interests and perhaps also different geopolitical uh, geopolitical agenda, uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, the, uh, in, in talking about international cooperations, we also still look at how domestic and national interests uh, even uh, often uh, compromise the uh, uh, and uh, and being more prioritized than the global interest although we've seen uh, we've seen uh, or we know we realize that uh, global interest also need to be pursued uh, we also uh, have seen that uh, the uh, there is insufficient mechanisms uh, during uh, uh, the last two years of dealing with the pandemic where where uh, many international organizations do not really have capacity do not really have uh, authority to deal with the uh, to deal with the uh, issue at hand. Uh, so uh, to conclude my uh, my presentations, uh, I I think I need to uh, I need to highlight the challenges that Indonesia try uh, to uh, would face, especially in order to push for the uh, big teams of recover together, recover stronger. The first one is to reconcile uh, G20 mem members' diverse interests and perspective. Some of them already uh, uh, already passed the the worst situations and already in the track of uh, uh, recovery, while others still need to uh, to deal with uh, health problems. Uh, uh, while uh, on the other hand, advanced economies with their G20 also have more resources, and it seems uh, that uh, G20 now becomes a, a serious deal. Uh, for uh, those advanced economies. This is a bit different than the situations in 2008, where at that time, G20 was e uh, even was more important and prof uh, provide or deliver uh, 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 concrete proposals compared to G8 at that time, G7 or G8 at that time. Uh, uh, now the situation uh, is in the reverse, while G20 seems to be in a good way, on in good shape to uh, deal with the uh, uh, global agenda, uh, and Indonesia has has a uh, has a challenge to reconcile G27 and G20 agenda. Uh, although, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have to <coughs> to put all those uh, uh, diverse interests uh, into an uh, in, uh, into an appropriate and uh, priority interest, uh, and and. Uh, uh, of course, the another the last thing that uh, I need to highlight is that uh, Indonesia need to keep the discussion focus on agenda related to the recovery process, uh, so that uh, it would also uh, make the 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 discussion uh, make uh, the uh, the uh, the priority uh, and the action plans that will be taken uh, uh, would be have a very, uh, has a strong leverage. Uh, toward the global economic recovery. With that, I conclude my presentations, uh, Philippa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yose. It's all very perfect timing. Um, and thank you so much also for that very sober and critical analysis, again, of the challenges that are still exist within the G20. Um, I think you highlighted really important points about challenges and cooperation um, that Indonesia will have to face next year when it's time to be the president for next year's G20. Um, so before we move on to our final speaker, I want to remind everyone to join our Q&A session by posting your questions. Um, if you're joining in Zoom, you can post them in the Q&A box down below. Or if you're in YouTube, you can also uh, post them on the chat box and we'll monitor them. And I will be asking them to our speakers after the presentations. 
So, um, all right, let's move on to our final speaker then. We've heard about the agenda, both legacy and priority agenda for next year, but Dr. Yose has also put an interesting perspective of the challenges um, to achieve that agenda and what are still missing within the G20 mechanisms. Um, so our final speaker, Dr. Patrick Ziegenhain, um, is an associate professor at the Department of International Relations at President University Indonesia. He has a long academic record in several universities in Indonesia, in Malaysia, as well as in Germany. Um, and his main areas of research are in economic, political, and social developments in Southeast Asia and Europe, as well as international relations in both regions. So Dr. Patrick would like to hear from you, especially in the G20 or around Indonesia and German bilateral cooperation as well um, for economic recovery. And you have 20 minutes from now. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Patrick Ziegenhain. Um, welcome. Yeah, I'm very happy to see all the colleagues here around. I, Bahafas, long time no see, but also hello to Dr. Jose, Dr. Sominto. Nice to be together with you. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure for me to take part in this workshop. I was invited on very short notice, uh, but I'm I try to make a presentation representing the role of Germany, representing some perspectives from Germany. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, that's. I prepared some slides, and I will explain a bit about the background of the development of the COVID-19 pandemic in Germany. Then come to the economic impact on Germany, and then come to some conclusions about international trade and the cooperation between Germany and Indonesia in the G20. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic was a bit different in Germany than in Indonesia. It, in Germany, uh, it didn't start very strongly in March and 2020, just similar to Indonesia, but whereas in Indonesia, it was quite constant. In Germany, there were two major waves of um, infections and death. And we see here one in December, January here, which um, caused a lot of deaths. And also I lost a family member, my uncle, the older brother of my father passed away in January, 2021. And then it went down and, but in May and June, there was another wave. But the third wave that many people are fearing in Germany might not take place because a lot of Germans are already vaccinated now. We can see here from the latest data from 1st November 2021 that in some region in Germany, up to 80%, 70% of the population are already one time vaccinated or completely vaccinated. Only in the eastern part of Germany and in southeast Bavaria, there are lower vaccination rates. But overall, this already looks quite healthy, particularly if we compare it with the vaccination development in other countries. Of course, um, I will. I hope you can see this. It's um, the economic development of German GDP. Um, we see that even before uh, the pandemic, there were no high growth rates in Germany. German economy was already a bit struggling, but then there was particularly in the second half of 2020, a minus 10 economic decline, which was quite significant. It, Germany could recover somewhat, but still, uh, growth rates in Germany are very moderate, to say this. And if you look in, oh, okay, this is also the business climate in Germany, uh, meaning those uh, companies have been interviewed and how they see their perspectives for the near future. And here, of course, it was very negative when the corona pandemic hit Germany. It recovered somewhat, but it's still not stable and still not as positive as before the pandemic. So meaning there are still a lot of doubts among the German companies about the economic perspectives in the future. If you look on a global level, these are the G20 countries, all the G20 countries, uh, which are affected by the global pandemic. This is OECD data comparing the fourth quarter of 2019 with the second quarter of 2021, the latest available data. We see that not only uh, Indonesia is here, yeah? You see Indonesia declined maybe one or 2% of GDP in this period. But other economies, uh, um, 
Jose called it the more the richer countries have less damage, but I'm not so sure. If you look on the economic damage and the GDP decline, we see that countries like United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, France, these are EU countries were affected among the most heavy. Of course, India, yeah. Okay, that's a uh, yeah, huge developing country. But here we have seen all the EU countries and also the Euro area were among the most uh, negatively affected by the economic crisis including Germany, whereas other countries, yeah, could already faster recover. This, of course, as I said, um, has several reasons. We already seen in the presentation of uh, Dr. Jose also that there was an increase of public debt. This is also true for Germany. Germany, um, you see, before Germany always had very balanced budgets and there were no debt increase because also there is a paragraph in the German constitution that there is... Um, how to say not an indefinite um, space of a scope of action for increase of debts, but in when the anti-COVID measures started in 2020, we can see that German debt increased up to 2.3 billion euro. Uh, that's quite significant increase, and yeah, Germany is affected. Let's come to the vaccination. Um, I think. It's true what the German ambassador, the new German ambassador, um, Ms. Gebel said, it's about the um, that Germany is the biggest donor to COVAX and, uh, or the second biggest to, uh, yeah, it's donating, but we also have to see that this was not always the case. In the beginning of the pandemic, when the vaccine was available here in early 2021, and uh, there was quite some vaccine nationalism not only from Germany, but also from many other European countries and the United States, of course, who first vaccinated their populations. And then only in May or June, when there was more vaccine available on the market, then they gave it to developing countries. Uh, I was all the time here in Indonesia. And as you know, here, vaccine was only available in June, July or so, whereas all my colleagues in Germany already got their vaccination. It's also part of the story. Okay, now let's come to uh, some points of the EU and Germany's trade policy. Um, Germany is not completely independent trade policy. You know that this is a task of the European Union. There is a free trade agreement between, it's in process, it's uh, between Indonesia and the European Union, but not Germany has a, can make a single trade agreement on that, but it's usually the EU or the European Commission who are dealing with all these international trade affairs. And Germany, of course, as the biggest trading country in Europe and the fourth biggest in the world, of course, has a big interest in promoting economic recovery by an increase in global trade. Um, and all, we can say uh, it's not so well known, but the biggest player together in uh, exports of goods and services is the European Union. It's not the US, it's not China, but the EU as a bloc together is the biggest trading player in the world. And of course, it was um, affected heavily. But I think also we have to look in the 21st century into the future, into Asia, um, not only China, but also the yeah, ASEAN countries and others. This will be one of the largest growing, um, let's say, trading partners. And of course, there is new dynamics due to CPTPP and RCEP, the uh, free trade agreements, regional agreements in the Southeast Asian region. Indonesia is soon to be joined uh, RCP, ECP. And um, so there will be also, I think, a new trade dynamic. I found an interesting um, prognosis from the um, Boston Consulting Group here about the trade perspectives in the future. Um, and we see here in the green color, you, I hope you can see this, here are the, it's a world map. Here you have Asia with China here and ASEAN here. We have the European Union here and United States here. And we see what will uh, the future bring in trade. There are some prognoses, the countries in, or the trade in the green color will be improving. And we see, for example, between the European Union and ASEAN, there is a, pro, um, yeah, will grow quite significantly. Also ASEAN and United States, but also ASEAN and China, you see in all directions, but it will suffer in the years to come. And this has to do what um, Dr. Jose said before, the global tensions between the superpowers, between US and China. And this is the biggest damage with the trade war started by Donald Trump and retaliated by the Chinese government. This will have a significant impact on many other um, global 
trade arrangements. And it's also, yeah, together with the current COVID pandemic, one of the major hindrances for future trade. And um, yeah. Okay, I can explain um, more details on this in uh, the question and answer session. Let's come to my last point, which I would like to make. Uh, that's Germany and Indonesia. What they can do. I mean, we already heard the German ambassador speaking, and we could hear a lot of people. What could be done? Yeah, it's true. We must be realistic, but also on the hand, on the other hand, have some ambitions. Yeah, meaning multilateralism, such as a global forum as G20 or G7. They are, of course, more decisive. But on the bilateral level, um, Indonesia and Germany can also move some things forward. At least if they can influence their regional organization or these multilateral organizations to uh, push certain things forward. Um, of course, both are big economies and um, yeah, they have an impact on the global economic recovery. It, recover together. I think Germany and Indonesia can play a role. Um, and of course, their impact on the regional organizations as already mentioned. And that's why I think there should be an increased cooperation between Germany and Indonesia in the near future via the regional organizations, but also bilateral uh, in order to, yeah, to have an impact on this agenda of the G20 in, uh, agenda of Indonesia, which deals among others with climate change, environmental protection, reduction of global poverty, but also, and that's the most important one, global trade. Both countries can give, make significant contributions to increase um, global trade, to reduce tariff barriers and to um, yeah, care for a mutual benefit of both countries in the future. Okay, that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. Um, I think uh, you raised really important points about the changing trade dynamics, as well as um, what you would recommend that Germany and Indonesia can increase their cooperation on. Um, especially in promoting trade cooperation, as well as cooperation on global issues such as climate change, environmental protection, global poverty and equality. And yeah, you emphasize the global trade cooperation as necessary. Um, and I think we'll touch mm -hmm. upon some of the more details of that trade dynamics later in the question and answer. Uh, and we have a lot of things to unpack here uh, from our three panelists. So let's just jump right into the question and answer since we already have several in the Q&A <coughs> box. And I also just want to remind everyone, the audience both here on Zoom and also in YouTube to drop your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box on YouTube. We are monitoring that as we speak and we'll be asking those to the panelists. Um, so we will jump to the first question directly. Um, I think let's uh, start with a question to Dr. Suminto. And this one is from uh, Pak Muhammad Karisma. Um, you started off our discussion with highlighting the legacy agenda and the priority agenda of Indonesia's T20 presidency. But on a more basic level, a lot of Indonesians are curious to hear what exactly are the benefits for Indonesia in taking up the role as the president of T20? Um, do you think that this can be a momentum for Indonesia to really step up and represent the views of the, the developing countries as well as of the Southeast Asia region? And do you believe that Indonesia can relay the, interest, the interests of the developing countries, particularly when we're talking about equal recovery? And if so, how do you think uh, that Indonesia is planning to do this? Um, what is Indonesia bringing differently from last year's G20? And how can we ensure that we are achieving that deliverables? So uh, Dr. Suminto, feel free to start the answer. Uh, thank you, Felipa, and also thank you, Pa Muhammad Harisma, uh, for the questions. Uh, in many uh, forums, uh, the uh, the same questions uh, arise. What is the benefit of uh, the Indonesia to uh, hosting the, the the G20? Yeah, of course. Um, firstly, uh, hosting the G20 uh, uh, will be benefited in terms of uh, leadership. How the Indonesia could. Uh, so the uh, leadership in the global forum. We should note that the G20 is an informal forum without a secretariat or permanent secretariat. So that's why the, 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 the position of the presidency will be more important because the presidency could set the agenda 
or agenda setting will be in the hand of the presidency. That is why uh, we have the opportunity to show our leadership by hosting the G20. Of course, we um, uh, realize and we are aware that uh, in uh, what so called uh, setting agenda, we should have the support from, from other members because of the nature of the uh, G20 that is a consensus base. So that, of course, in this respect, our diplomacy is very much important, including uh, related to your question that uh, Indonesia also should uh, reflect the, uh, the interest of the ASEAN, the developing countries, the emerging economies. So uh, we should capi uh, capitalize this one as well to uh, what so called get the uh, support to the Indonesia presidency uh, agenda. This is the first one. The the the, the second one, uh, holding presidency will allow us to showcasing the success of our development. We could showcase various aspects of the development including, for example, infrastructure, connectivity, digitalization for SMEs, for example. Uh, for example, uh, just uh, uh, yesterday, or uh, I believe that the day before yesterday, you know that uh, uh, Ratu Maxima, for example, uh, price the, 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 the success of Indonesia in uh, providing the ecosystem for the digitalization in which uh, Ratu Maxima mentioning the Gojek, how the Gojek is successfully uh, what so called support the, 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 the SMEs, uh, what so called uh, supports the uh, what so called uh, employment uh, environment by providing uh, various opportunity uh, uh, to the people to join on the platform. So this is uh, just an example how we could uh, showcase the success of the uh, development of the, of, the, of the country. And thirdly, uh, we could note that um, by uh, holding the presidency, it is expected that it would raise the confidence of the uh, global society, including market and investors to the Indonesian economy. By this uh, building confidence, it is expected that the investment will come to the country. This is uh, just uh, some, uh, some uh, what so called uh, aspect uh, could be identified in respect to the benefit of the country in uh, holding the presidency position uh, 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 next, uh, uh, next year. And also, Felipe, uh, I see the, the, the next question of uh, Mohammed Charisma. It is how to, what so called, uh, change the, and response uh, than the critic in respect to uh, holding the presidency that moving logistic to the organized uh, meeting and conferences. I, I believe that it, re, it is related with what pre, uh, earlier, uh, what previously I has mentioned that the nature of the G20 that is informal, uh, consensus based, without permanent secretariat is uh, providing us with the opportunity to setting agenda in what so called we should be different. I mean, uh, we are not holding, we are not only holding presidency by providing logistics, <laughs> but uh, we are setting the agenda. And hopefully uh, we could uh, provide a uh, uh, good agenda and uh, could have a good legacy for the, uh, what so called, uh, for the uh, global economy, especially interacting the global economic uh, governance. It is, uh, better in the future. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Suminto. I think I would like to ask the same question to uh, Dr. Yose, because Dr. Yose, in your presentation, you were more critical about the what you see as the current limitations of G20 and what you hope that G20 would be able to achieve beyond agenda setting and economic governance. So um, same question to you. What do you think Indonesia should do um, beyond um, what has traditionally been done in G20, are there opportunities for Indonesia to really push us on the cooperation to provide more practical action steps towards economic recovery? Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I like to uh, 
uh, uh, clarify. I, I, I'm not really critical or opposed to the G20 process. For sure, I always see that G20 process is very important, especially to set the uh, uh, agenda for for the future, uh, for uh, important uh, important aspects in the economic cooperations and global governance. And, uh, uh, and G20 also already uh, uh, quite uh, successful in promoting that, uh, uh, that kind of cooperations. But uh, again, uh, as I mentioned before, the uh, G20 uh, tends to become uh, too big uh, and it's like uh, uh, like uh, a big uh, organizations or big uh, uh, forum anywhere, it's uh, uh, sometimes difficult to move uh, outside of this trajectory or uh, outside of this comfort zone. Uh, Pak pa Suminto mentions about legacy issues. And I believe that uh, around 70% of uh, G20 priority agendas normally are legacy issues that have been carried out uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for several years, uh, even more than seventy percent. So it means that uh, it only uh, uh, give rooms for around 25, 30 percent for uh, uh, other issues. Now I, I think uh, during the crisis it has to be reversed. So uh, the the uh, the, the uh, uh, current and import emergency issues has to be taken more seriously. Uh, perhaps could be around 70% of the attention, while the 30% uh, can be uh, filled by the legacy issues, which is which would be uh, important in order to deal with the post-pandemic uh, era or the, uh, the global governance in the future. I think this kind of things still, uh, Indonesia still can uh, push or, or uh, to that uh, area, to that uh, the, uh, directions, uh, and if uh, Indonesia can do that, uh, uh, in my opinions, it would really uh, beneficial, especially for other developing countries that will take up the presidency after Indonesia, which is uh, 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 India and also Brazil uh, and South Africa later on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Fayose, for the answer and that clarification. Um, so let's move on to the, the issue of cooperation, especially between Indonesia and Germany. Um, I think, Dr. Patrick, this question goes to you from uh, Satrio Santoso, because you've mentioned about the trade dynamics and also you emphasize the importance of cooperation, both in terms of bilateral cooperation or also multilateral or regional between EU and ASEAN. So looking at the rise of bilateralism and multilateralism during this pandemic era, and also the importance of Southeast Asia region, um, how do you see the Germany, um, how will Germany position itself in Southeast Asia? Are there any concrete plans from Germany to work closely with ASEAN or with Indonesia in 2022? Uh, or if you can touch upon what sectors that Germany will be supporting in Indonesia and what do you expect to see from Indonesia's presidency uh, in G20 2022. So Dr. Patrick? Yeah, I think yeah. what specifically German government is planning for initiatives, I think uh, our ambassador, uh, Ms. Lepel can more explain in detail uh, what's planned. Of course, I know that there is the Indo-Pacific strategy of the German government has been passed last year. This means more attention for ASEAN and the countries in Southeast Asia, um, but the Germany, is um, how to say the foreign policy is um, based on trade and trade is a European Union um, matter. So I think, no, don't expect, I think uh, realistically that Germany can turn around to things here. Yeah? Germany is a big economic nation. And, um, but I think in terms of power play, I mean, you look about these, these um, submarine deal between Australia, US and China and the South China Sea and so on. I think Germany will, uh, yeah, play a moderating role, but cannot. It's not a decisive player in this issue. Better if the Europeans can find a common position in the European Union. And now I make a big difference to ASEAN. Yeah, European Union can speak with one voice by the European Commission, and it can lead to um, how to say trade negotiations and so on. Yeah, that's that's the task of the European Commission. And in so far, I think this would be the German. Uh, foreign policy towards Southeast Asia and um, Indonesia should be embedded in the European policy 
and particularly in the trade policy of the European Union. That's my point on this. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick. Um, also still to Dr. Patrick, because I think this question relates to Indonesia-Germany cooperation. Beyond the trade cooperation, I think earlier the ambassador mentioned there are cooperations on mangrove and other cooperations on global issues. Um, the question is from Paharyo Aswijahirono. Uh, for Indonesia-Germany cooperation, what can we learn from the failure of the red um, REDD cooperation between Indonesia and Norway? Are there lessons learned that we can um, apply when we're thinking of the cooperation between Indonesia and Germany? Yeah, of course, I read in the newspapers about the failure of the red uh, cooperation, but um, I'm not, how to say, I don't know the details. In There are different expectations. The Norwegians expected something, and what I read, Indonesia did not fulfill it. On the other hand, Indonesia expected money flowing, but this was also not coming. But I'm not uh, an expert. I, I, I would say, okay, what can we learn from this? I would say, um, if there is a cooperation, it must be clear what shall be the result and the uh, deliverables, yeah, what is the outcome and under which conditions can what happen? I mean, of course, Indonesian government is interested to have some financial support to keep the environment and to keep protect uh, yeah, rainforest and uh, flora and fauna here. Of course, they're interested, but on the other hand, uh, there must be also some, how to say, clear result that this is taking part, not only taking the money and doing nothing and just lip service, but of course, there must be some clear cut regulations on how this is working. But I think uh, the German government already has a lot of cooperation program via GIZ, and uh, the, there's a lot of cooperation in environmental issues. Um, and so far, I have not heard many complaints about this cooperation, but maybe also the German embassy <laughs> can tell more details about it. This is my perspective as an uh, academic observer only. Yeah? Yes, Ambassador Inalapo, um, do you want to add your perspective? Right, once I figure out how to unmute myself. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, actually, since there was a question about the concrete sectors of uh, cooperation during uh, the presidency of Indonesia of the G20, I think one of the sectors is the whole cluster of, of the green uh, climate, environment, energy. We have, uh, as uh, the professor pointed out, a significant uh, program financed not just by the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, but also by the Ministry of, Develop uh, of the Environment. So there are really considerable funds available. And we have geared them to this in particular also with regard to the G20 presidency. And uh, as the professor mentioned, uh, yes, they, they are so far going well. Although, uh, of course, since both our countries are uh, rules-based, uh, sometimes we have different sets of rules and then it becomes uh, complicated to reconcile the approaches to some financial nitty gritty. And I think this is something that is becoming more difficult because of the pandemic. Normally one would just sit together until things have been worked out. And now these kinds of things are becoming a little more difficult to handle. But so far, uh, we have not run into any particular problems. Another sector in which we have a good activity worth mentioning is uh, startups for the digital sector, which I also mentioned in, in my remarks. Uh, hopefully there we will have uh, something going between the cities of Berlin and Jakarta, which are very much in, involved in, in the startup business. And uh, also very concretely, we have offered uh, to uh, second uh, senior policy advisor for uh, Indonesia for the G20 presidency, in particular in this uh, green cluster. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for that answer. That helps clarify um, and uh, accurately answer the question. So thank you very much. Um, we have more questions uh, coming back into the topic of G20. Um, I think this question from Ibu Maria Catherine can go to Dr. Suminto. Uh, because we've learned that Indonesia will be the president of the G20 next year, while Germany will be the president of the G7. So how will this play out? And are the two groups in sync with one another? And how do we cooperate between um, the two efforts? 
Thank you, Felipa. Uh, I have learned from the literature that uh, there are four schools in viewing the relation between G7 and G20. Uh, firstly, uh, the school of uh, what's called redundant. It is uh, G20 uh, just uh, doing the same thing with what uh, uh, G7 uh, doing. The second one is the school of rejectionist, uh, uh, viewing that um, G20 role is uh, what you call could not could not replace or uh, compete <laughs> the G G uh, the G7 because of their uh, more resources. Uh, the third uh, school is uh, reinforcement. It is uh, between G, uh, G7 and G20 is uh, complementary. And the, the, the fourth school is uh, replacement in which it is my, maybe more uh, what you call optimistic in which G20 uh, is successfully replaced the role of the G7. I do believe that um, the uh, the school of the uh, reinforcement is much more realistic, meaning that uh, between G7 and G20 should develop the uh, cooperation. We should uh, reconcile the agenda, the priorities between uh, G7 and G20. We do, we we understand that, of course, uh, G7 represent the interests of advanced countries while the, G10, the G20 much more diverse because of uh, the members uh, include the advanced and emerging and also developing economies. And in this respect, I do believe that uh, G7 itself in which all members, also the members of G20 are aware with the uh, history of establishment of the G20 in which G20 was established due to the understanding that uh, the uh, role of the emerging economies, developing countries is much more important. Uh, we, we, we have the experience of the Asian financial crisis back to 1997-1998 in which it was systemic and could uh, influence uh, all uh, over the world, including the advanced countries. So that the advanced countries, the G7, have the uh, awareness that uh, involving the emerging market to the global economic governance is much more important. So that I do believe that uh, with this uh, setting and this uh, context, uh, G7 and G20 could work together hand in hand and to reconcile the agenda and their priorities uh, and could uh, find the common uh, what so-called interest uh, in the sake of the better future for all of us. Thank you very much for that answer, Dr. Suminto. Uh, the next question, before I move on to the next question, I want to remind our audience, both in Zoom and YouTube, that we still have time, so feel free to drop your questions either in the Q&A box in Zoom or in the chat box in YouTube. We'll be monitoring them and posting them to our panelists as we enjoy this fascinating and insightful discussion. Um, and we have more questions still. Um, still closely related to G20, but Jose earlier mentioned uh, the importance of building trust and that is both an opportunity as well as the challenge currently um, in terms of trust between um, countries. So due to the pandemic that closes borders and limits migration and also increases resource competition, uh, there is a global trust deficit. And this is a question from Ibu Fitriani um, in Zoom. So with that backdrop in mind, what are Indonesia as G20 president and Germany as the G7 president? What are our plans to bridge differences and foster trust? Um, and do you think also whether trust is essential for global recovery? Um, I'll pose the question to Dr. Suminto and perhaps I'll also ask um, Ms. Ambassador Inalapal to answer after this. Uh, Dr. Suminto. Yeah, thank you, Felipa. I do believe that partnership is the keywords. Yeah, uh, keywords for G7 itself, uh, keywords for the G20 itself, and keywords for the uh, G20 and G, uh, G7 uh, together. So I do believe that uh, uh, G7, uh, G20, and also G7 and G20 uh, together should build the trust because uh, only by the trust uh, we could discuss the agenda and finding the agreement, finding the consensus. Like in the G20, G20 is consensus space. We should build the trust. Without the trust, we could not reach a consensus and the deliverable will, could not be uh, reached. 
I have to believe that in terms of the relation between the G7 and the G20, and the trust is, on, on the, is also the, the key so that we could uh, reconcile the, the interests of, of in advanced countries rep represented in the G7 and the more diverse interests represented in the, uh, in the G20. And by the, in this trust, we could find uh, the, 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 the same uh, perspective, the same objective in the sake of the uh, global uh, economy, global uh, society, interest for the better future of all of us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Suminto and Ambassador Ina. Uh, thank you very much. I would agree with that analysis. Uh, I think one uh, element for trust between leaders is very much related to sitting in the same room, sharing coffee breaks together. And this element has been sadly missing recently, except that uh, uh, the last G20 meeting finally took place again, mostly physically, although not 100%. So I think that is one thing that will hopefully uh, get better now and make sure there is uh, trust between the participants. But when it comes to trust between the states, I think an important element is also to keep the commitments one makes. And that is something all the participating countries can and should do. And that's, of course, also why it's difficult sometimes to come to the compromise, because then countries know that for their credibility, for future trust, they actually have to do it. If I may give my intervention here, very Yes, fast. absolutely, Dr. Yes. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think uh, uh, on the first uh, or, or the second questions, whether uh, uh, we still need trust or not, I think it is very important. Otherwise, we're going to uh, end up with the, uh, the so-called uh, in international economics, there is a, a, a term beggar thy neighbors, meaning that you, uh, you put your domestic interest first, uh, although it hurts other uh, countries. And it happens actually uh, during the early uh, times of uh, the pandemic, where uh, uh, where countries uh, ban export of their PPE or even less uh, less coverage in the media, actually many countries also started to ban uh, export of food at their times. Yeah, so uh, so because they they uh, basically also they do they don't trust each uh, each each other that they that other will help them uh, if they also uh, they uh, uh, other. Uh, if they help uh, others. So it is still very uh, uh, imp important and one of the necessary conditions. Uh, I don't know how to address or to increase the trust. I don't have any good recipe, but I uh, uh, I agree with uh, His Excellency in a level. Uh, you don't, you cannot uh, even have trust if you have, if you don't have dialogue uh, to each other. Uh, so uh, the challenge for uh, Indonesia uh, next year is to bring back uh, President Putin and President Xi Jinping to come to Bali so that we can have a di uh, honest discussions uh, with uh, other leaders. Uh, uh, otherwise, uh, we uh, it would be very hard uh, to build trust uh, to uh, uh, among uh, uh, countries uh, uh, globally. Thank you so much for the analysis. Absolutely. I think we're all looking forward to in-person, offline um, as possible a meeting on the G20, perhaps enjoying fresh coconut in Bali. Hopefully that will um, help build trust amongst um, the members. Um, and I think the next question um, is still related to trust, but relating that to a global issue, um, some of which we've kind of discussed earlier. Um, I think, Dr. Yose, you raised important um, incidences where countries turn into nationalistic protectionist sentiments, especially earlier in the pandemic when things were a bit uncertain. Um, uh, Dr. Patrick and Dr. Yose earlier um, emphasizes the importance of um, equitable, sustainable, and open trade um, and economic um, and economic openness between countries as key towards economic recovery. And this also has been affirmed by world leaders in the Italy's G20 presidency. But at the same time, we are seeing an increasing trend of trade protectionism, especially through non-tariff measures, um, perhaps also as a response to the supply chain crisis that has been happening. 
Um, how can we reconcile these two tension, both in terms of wanting global cooperation, but also a lot of nationalistic tendencies and, and hesitancy to increase trade cooperation? Um, how can Indonesia lead the way um, to facilitate trade cooperation between countries? Uh, maybe I'll start with Dr. Patrick and then I'll go to Dr. Jose. Yeah. Yeah, we all know that Indonesia has also a lot of non-tariff barriers and also quite protectionist policies, trade policy. I mean, that's an open secret, yeah? Meaning it's uh, not that, uh, <laughs> I think many countries have this. Of course, um, I think the European Union has less, um, there, there, or it's more transparent than, um, let's say, in the, uh, Indonesia. And um, of course, uh, on the other end, one thing, um, with this vaccine nationalism, yes, um, I condemn it. I think it's morally not good. But if you are making surveys, I sh can show you some uh, opinion surveys in Germany and France in this time. Should we give our vaccines to poorer countries? I think 70% have said no. First, my country. Yeah. I think also if you make a survey in Indonesia, if there is something what Indonesia really has a lot of, um, but it's needed now, shall we export it? I think also 70% of Indonesians would say no. Uh, yeah, my country first. So that's, uh, and also these politicians under pressure. If Chokowi or uh, another, let's say, important politician said, suddenly says, no, uh, we don't use this vaccine for our population, but sell it to some, uh, give it to others. Oh, that would be demonstration in Jakarta or whatever. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it's it's a dilemma indeed. Yeah. Of course, we, uh, we sit here as uh, academics, we can, uh, let's say, easy talk and say, demand, yeah, please, fair share. On the world stage, but if you're a politician in this situation, uh, not so easy. Yeah, we have to be um, to see both sides. And um, yeah, but I think the, the best thing, of course, is uh, that uh, yeah, prevention to pre prepare something uh, that uh, yeah, that the situation does not occur. But I think this COVID pandemic is so uh, didn't, was very difficult to prepare. Nobody was talking about these uh, vaccines were not yet developed. Yeah. It was under production where, while the pandemic was running. So, okay, let's think about other issues. If there would be other pandemics which are already known, maybe it's better to have a stock or the World Health Organization has a more power to distribute it evenly. Yeah, but I think even in the future, we cannot 100% be sure that there is no vaccine nationalism, that there is no uh, nationalism at all because the decision makers in the countries they are elected by their people, yeah, and uh, they are responsible to them and accountable to them. So that's why they are in this dilemma. Sh shall I give it away or must I look to the people I'm accountable for? Yeah, that's my comment on that. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Dr. Yossi? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I do understand. Uh, uh, it's understandable to uh, prioritize uh, your country and your people. Uh, but uh, it has to be done uh, in uh, uh, in um, um, uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable, uh, under reasonable, um, uh, what you call this, under uh, uh, reasonable circumstances or reasonable uh, uh, condition, situation. Because uh, sometimes, uh, because of lack of trust uh, 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 and, and many other uh, many other conditions, uh, countries uh, tend uh, to uh, prioritize even if they uh, uh, prioritize themselves even if they don't really have um, uh, uh, if they don't really uh, 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 in the uh, in a gen dangerous situations like for example I uh, I mentioned about how countries banning their uh, uh, food export uh, in the early times of uh, pandemic. Uh, countries is uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, several countries in South Asia also put uh, export ban uh, to their food export. Uh, uh, although at that time there was no uh, threat about food security, there was no uh, 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 potentials of having food shortage. But still, they put the, uh, their ban uh, and then try uh, try to prioritize uh, themselves. It. Uh, if that happens, even if, the, if there would be self-fulfilling prophecy, self-fulfilling uh, situations where the, the, the dangers, uh, it might come into realizations, although initially uh, the, the dangerous situation uh, did not really present. Um, so 
uh, 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 how to deal with that, uh, in my opinion, first, you have to be able to uh, have a greater exchange of information because greater exchange of information will increase transparency and will uh, increase also uh, trust between uh, each, each other. Uh, and uh, people know what the situation is, uh, the, the real situations or better a better uh, better perspective on the real situations. Uh, uh, the second thing also, we should also come up with some kind of safety net, uh, 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 international safety net on several uh, important issues, like for example, on health issue. We we didn't really have this kind of uh, health safety net, uh, sufficient health safety net uh, uh, during the first uh, uh, earlier periods of the pandemic. We also, uh, although uh, we also uh, already have had several uh, food, uh, uh, international food uh, security issues for several times, such as in 2008, uh, for example, we didn't, we never come up with an international uh, food safety net, uh, sufficient, uh, a sufficient one, uh, uh, the one that really works. Uh, uh, and also, um, uh, on the financial issues, although the, 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 uh, the currently we're having this kind of a regional uh, safety net, uh, financial safety net, the so-called Chiang Mai Initiative, uh, CMIM, uh, uh, people still think or uh, uh, the member countries also still see that it would not be sufficient. So the, uh, this uh, sufficient uh, safety net would be important also to uh, to uh, uh, to make this uh, the 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 expectations uh, under a reasonable uh, reasonable uh, consideration uh, uh, to for the situation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Jose, and also Dr. Patrick for that. Um, we have several minutes left, and we still have several questions to go through. Um, I would like to return to Dr. Suminto. Um, this question is from Mas Dandi Ravi Prandi. Um, we've earlier touched upon vaccine nationalism, vaccine access, and that is also part of the legacy um, issue, legacy agenda that Indonesia will have to undertake um, next year. And um, reflecting on how the current uh, vaccine distribution is going with the COVAX facility that has been criticized as being slow and missing its target, I think the latest number right now, COVAX has shipped over 406 million vaccines but yeah, that is still far below the 2 billion doses that it's, it was aiming for earlier this year. Uh, so Dr. Suminto, Ms. Dandi would like to ask, um, how can Indonesia's G20 presidency amplify developing countries' interests, especially in dealing with unequal vaccine access and distribution, as well as with uneven economic recovery? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, we will continue. Uh, some initiative has been uh, established uh, within the G20 to ensure the uh, access uh, to the to the to the vaccine. Just recently, uh, we established the uh, multilateral leaders uh, task force uh, to monitor and in ensure the achievement of the target 40% and 70% of vaccination by uh, the end of this year and by uh, the mid of. Uh, next year, uh, the multilateral leaders uh, task force consisting of WHO, uh, WTO, uh, IMF, and uh, World Bank, representing all important uh, multilateral institutions dealing with the vaccine, either uh, research and development, uh, production, distribution, uh, trade, uh, supply chains, and also uh, financing. So all of the constraints in ensuring the access to, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, vaccine, especially for developing uh, countries and less developed countries are uh, addressed, uh, including uh, through this uh, platform. So that many initiative has been uh, established. Uh, it is expected that, uh, it is expected that uh, through this various initiative in which we address uh, all aspects of the, of the vaccine from the research development, production, distribution, uh, trade, supply chains, financing, yeah, we could, we, could, we could help, we could help. Of course, if, uh, we just uh, discussing uh, still uh, 
uh, many constraints, including in, for example, uh, vac uh, uh, vaccine uh, sharing from the advanced countries in which uh, they already have more stock and maybe more than uh, what uh, they are uh, actually uh, needed. But uh, as has been uh, mentioned by uh, Patrick or uh, pa, you see that uh, still, of course, uh, uh, what so called a degree of nationalism, uh, including vaccine uh, national, nationalism, still there. But we do believe that the partnership, the dialogue, the discussion, uh, including through the G20 with various initiatives, has been established. We could uh, settle this this uh, situation. Maybe not. 100 uh, set of the situation. Um, ourself, we, uh, ourself, we uh, have the experience, for example, in the early of the uh, pandemic, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around March, April uh, last year, how we negotiate, for example, with South Korea in respect to the uh, personal uh, protective equipment at the time. You know that um, uh, South uh, Korea uh, companies operating in Indonesia in Indonesia in certain uh, special zones in which they uh, produce this equipment to uh, uh, export to their country, and it is the previous arrangement like this because they operate operated in the uh, in the special zone for the export purposes, and then in the situation in which uh, who need the APD is not only South Korea but also Indonesia. So while in the uh, in the in the in the design, uh, this company uh, what so called produce for export to the to uh, the countries, but at the same time Indonesia also needed. We could negotiate it, and then okay, uh, we could uh, come to the agreement. Oh, okay, at at this uh, situation maybe we could. 50-50, 50 percent 50. <laughs> will be exported, while 50 percent will be uh, used by the country. This is just one example. Of course, not uh, what's your calls, uh, not uh, 100, because at the end of the day, what we want to achieve is win-win for all. So uh, we we uh, we could not uh, just only uh, what's your calls uh, try to. Uh, achieve our self-interest, but also in the same time uh, reconcile with interests of others, so that we could find the solution, the best solution, better off for all parties. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Dr. Suminto, for the answer. Um, we are running short on time, so let me end the the panel session today with one short question that I will direct to all panelists. So to Dr. Suminto, Dr. Patrick, and Dr. Yose, if you can just share one quick sentence about what would you like to see achieved um, or what would you like to see prioritized in Indonesia's next year G20 presidency, either delivering on legacy agenda or achieving a new priority agenda. Um, that would be a wrap up and a conclusion to our discussion today as we move forward in our planning for next year's G20. So let me start with um, Dr. Suminto and then I'll go to Dr. Patrick and Dr. Yose. Yeah, thank you, Philippa. Of course, one important or most important words is recovery. So that we would like to uh, support and accelerate the global economic recovery. We could recover together. We could recover stronger, right? Okay, thank you. Perfect, Dr. Patrick. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I also <laughs> thought economic recovery is the basis for all of this. and. Um, I think it's also in a relatively short term doable. Climate change and the, all the others take more time. You cannot do it in one year, but you can set some foundations for a future cooperation. But the short term, what is doable is better um, trade recovery, yeah? Economic recovery by better trade, yeah. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Yose. Yes, um, I, I also agree with that. Uh, so the focus would be the recovery. And the, the biggest challenge that Indonesia need to, uh, to address, actually how to reconcile uh, all those various interests uh, so that uh, all uh, stakeholders and also all uh, important economies can go hand in hand together uh, to deal with the, uh, with the situations for the global advancement. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you so much for the answer. I think we have our underlying conclusion about the importance of economic recovery through trade, through cooperation, balancing all of the national interests. Um, and I would like to say thank you so much to our three very great panelists today for your insight to Dr. Suwinto, Dr. Patrick, and Dr. Jose Rizal. A huge thank you for um, your perspective. And thank you so much to the audience for the wonderful questions that really lively, uh, livened the discussion earlier today. Um, and with this, I would return it to Ms. Sheila. Thank you, Ms. Felipa. And thank you as well to Dr. Suminto, Dr. Jose, and Dr. Patrick for the fruitful hours of discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have finally come to the end of sessions of today. Before I end today's session, I would like to make a kind reminder that we will have another session tomorrow at 2 p.m. Jakarta time or 8 a.m. Berlin time with the theme of seizing momentum for sustainability through the G20. We hope that you could join us again tomorrow. Thank you and see you at our next session. Terima kasih, Pak Suminto. Terima kasih. Presentasinya, Pak. Terima kasih, Ibu Ambassador. Terima kasih. Terima kasih, Bapak Ibu semua. Bu Nina Lepo. Bu Safia.